Lady Diana, as a child who used to stay with your grandfather, the Duke of Rutland, at Beaver Castle, you must have experienced there a kind of life that just doesn't go on anymore. The... the train de vie, mustn't talk French, the um, uh, life... Yes. ...could not be more different. Vast staff of... Um, uh, upholsterers and carpenters and foresters and... Uh, even night sawmill, <laughs> every single thing that made up a whole community, you know, Even and enough enough staff to make a choir in the chapel, terrible choir, but still it was a choir of um, housemaids and footmen, and and then um, there were night watchmen on the estate too, were there not? They were the, yes, they were the night watchmen. I don't know whether they exist at all today, but we had great comfort at night hearing the gravel crunch under the night watchman's foot, and he'd call out, past 12 o'clock, all's well, and that gave us comfort. Mm -hmm. But what didn't give us comfort was if we went tooling along the passages after dark, and it was completely dark. We used to go up to bed with uh, candles and extinguishers. And so when once we'd all gone to bed, if you went out in the passage and met the night watchman indoors, that was terrifying because he had padded feet and a um, sort of bullseye lantern and you'd get a nasty fright there. But uh, the, the, out, the outside watchman was very comfortable. There was no indoor illumination apart from yeah. oil and candles. Oil and candles. And an oil man and two candle men. Bathrooms, hot water? No. Yeah. Nothing? Not a suspicion. There was uh, what we now call loos, but no bathroom of any kind. My mother did all that when, when I was 15 already. I mean, mm. after my age of 15, there was nothing, because my grandfather lived to be very old, and he never put in anything. Your education included a, a first-rate grounding in all the arts. Your, your mother was a very talented artist, wasn't she? She was very talented, both in drawing and in sculpture and in music. And uh, she had very great taste. And a lot of things were common. Even tomatoes were rather common. <laughs> and uh, I still use the word common, meaning something quite different what people mean today. Oh, you can't do that's common. You can't hold somebody's hand, that's common. Mm. And uh, then she taught us, well, all day long she played the piano. Not all that well, but plodding away at a score, and generally Wagner. You studied at the Slade School yourself? Well, I studied this Slade School really more for fun and for a very short time. And I lived in Gower Street in those days, and it was next door to Gower Street. And we had Tonks as the master, and we had a man who I learned to love, who was called Ambrose McEvoy, who is and hardly known now. And he was on the staff of teaching us. But um, I was never very good. No, I was never good. As a family, you mixed with many people in the theatre. Very much so, because we were brought up almost, almost totally with the Tree family. The children were roughly the same age, and we had run of the theatre, and could go whenever we liked, and this was encouraged. From the age of five, I suppose, I went to Julius Caesar, and used to go on the stage, Always, with the crowd. Mm-hmm. This must have been exciting. Oh, wonderful, yes. Yes, Caesar, we'll lend you our years. Yes, we'll lend you our years. <laughs> and rhubarb, rhubarb. <laughs> no, not rhubarb. No, no, following the man. Oh, poor Caesar. Oh, poor Caesar. Oh, look at his wounds. It was like that. And then we used to um, always be in uh, Sir Herbert Tree's dressing room on his most nervous moments, I suppose, playing with his rings and saying, can we see your beard put on, Mr... I used to call him Mr. Daddy, because the children called him Daddy, and you couldn't yeah. say anything but Mr. before everybody. Hello, Mr. Daddy. 
Can I see you put your beard on? And he was so patient and so good with us. After you came out, you had a reputation for being one of the wild ones, one of the first of the bright young things. Yes, it's very difficult to believe why, <laughs> but I suppose I did. I suppose I did, and I don't quite know why, but I always had publicity. Mm. There's a very pleasant story of you at a London function at which the guest of honour was the Crown Prince of Germany, a function at which medals were to be worn, and I believe you wore yours. I wore my um, Bath Club medals, that's all I had, but I bought another to make them look flashier, which was an old Saint-Esprit, and nobody said don't. I can't think why my mother said you can't wear your Bath Club medals. <laughs> Everybody else was showing their gongs, you know, and here was I with my Bath Club, half a mile, quarter of a mile, whole mile, <laughs> <laughs> and very naturally, the crowd, Little Willie, as he came to be known, uh, naturally, they always do royalty, they've seen medals, you know, and it's a great thing to look at. So he looked at these medals and was enormously surprised which uh, with the result that I had a long talk with him because he was so f amused by these medals. Wouldn't have am I don't think it would have amused a civilian, as it were, but, you know, somebody who was a soldier and who was a king uh, was always fascinated by medals. <laughs> so, therefore, I got off with him. In the first war, you were a nurse? In the first war, I went to Guy's. Guy's Hospital, very much against anybody's will. Terrible to do, there was, because I was determined to go. And then the ladies used to be brought to me to tell me that I'd be raped, because um, all soldiers coming back from the war just handled the nurses as they liked. It was total law, totally untrue. Anyway, I was in the civilian branch with cancer, not with war wounds. And I was happy at Guy's, but it was very, very hard. I'm sure it was. And after the war, you married a young man in the Foreign Office who was later to be a statesman and historian, Mr. Yes. Duff Cooper, who became Lord Norwich. And that was a trouble, too, because they didn't like him very much. And they'd expected better of me. <laughs> but they soon realised, sweetly realised, that they were wrong, and then... My husband became what they liked very much, which was a member of parliament, and they hadn't had a member of parliament in their family for a long time. And then as he graduated to being a minister, then we had the king's rooms and we had everything of the best. We were the favoured ones then. Now, you were beautiful and popular and talented and a leading figure in London society. This gave you the status, the popular status, that today is accorded only to an international film star, didn't it? Well, it's very nice for you to say so. I wouldn't put it quite as high as that. But I had enough uh, publicity. And one I can't quite tell what gives one publicity. But I had it, and I disliked it rather. But I didn't dislike it when it gave me the miracle. Yes. Well, before that, you did, in fact, become a film star, didn't you? Oh, yes, but I've forgotten it. It was so bad. <laughs> it was a silent film. Yes. And it was done by a very nice man who'd been turned out of Hollywood. Hollywood is too bad to go on. And uh, I did two films, but I don't really like to remember them very much. Was it as a result of these two films that... No. ...you got the invitation to no. play the Madonna in The Miracle? No. I think that Reinhardt when it was suggested that I should play the miracle, asked to see the films. I see. And he said, escape or something, but I don't think he was interested in the films at all. As a child, had you seen the original London, London yes, production of the piece? I had. I'd seen it at Olympia. Had it made a big effect on you? Ah, yes, and it's also had the effect, you see, that when I was offered it, I felt I can do that, because I shan't have to say anything. It mm -hmm. was such a wonderful break. Yes. I feel anybody can get away with it if they don't have to have elocution. Yes, it, it was a big musical spectacle. Well, in, played... in, in Olympia, it was circus, it was horses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was enormous, you can imagine. But even in America, it was very large. Yes. And in a huge theatre, which was built like a cathedral, with um, stained glass windows all the way around, 
and the pillars themselves were made the whole way round so that the audience could go onto the chancel and walk around after the show was over. Yes. So that it was total and pews, you see, it was like that. But it was so big that if you, when you played the nun, you had to have um, dressing rooms the other end to change into. And when we did it in Dortmund, we had motor cars, like Olympia, to take us inside. Take you from the stage to your dressing room? Well, wherever the dressing room was. Yes. How many seasons did you do the miracle? Well, I did it about four in America, I think. And then uh, we went to Budapest and Prague and Vienna and Dortmund. And then later, much later, in England Captain. and the provinces. At the Lyceum? At the Lyceum. As the Madonna, you had to stay motionless on Yes, I had to pillar. stay motionless for a very long time. About an hour, I believe. Yes, but on the other hand, you see, you can, you can do it if you're being looked at. But I could never do it in rehearsal. But the mere fact is everybody waiting for you to move hmm. keeps you pretty stationary. A great strain, nevertheless. Get used to it. Lynn Harding, who was in the, in the London production, once told me of your courage in still keeping perfectly still while an insect strolled on your face. Well, I don't think the insect strolled over my face. The insect was inside my crown, and that was hurting more than I can tell you. And uh, I had to invent things. My husband was in America. Um, making his first lecture there, and I had to go on saying, if I can bear this, it will be a good lecture. But otherwise it was, it was awful, that, because, you know, not to, not to move, and something's irritating you to that extent. And another night I fainted, and that was very bad, too, because I knew that when I fell, if I did fall, I'd fall on electric spiked candles, mm. which would rob me of my sight. And so I went on praying to God, of course, and to biting the inside of my lip and hoping something would happen. And there's no curtain, so that if any disaster of that kind happens, there's nothing to be done except put the lights out. And it was prohibition at the time. However, they got me out, they put the lights out and they carried me off the stage and poured brandy down my throat and then put me up again. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy was wonderful. Did the trick. Did the audience realise that no. it, they accepted it as, oh, as part of the plot? Oh, I don't think the audience understood half. All those hundreds of performances of the miracle constituted your entire career on the stage, didn't they? You, did you not want to become a professional actress after that? Well, I always thought I wasn't equipped at all because although it was, uh, I had the wonderful advantage of Reinhardt as a teacher, I knew that I hadn't produced my voice in any way, and... No, I don't think I did, besides which there was too much going on now with my married life and with Duff becoming a states um, politician and a, then a minister. And yes, you spent... It all went on. I spent my time with that, really. You travelled with him a lot. I yeah, travelled with him a lot, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that go with it, with the constituency work and all that. He was first Lord of the Admiralty in the 30s. Well, he was first um, War Office. And after War Office, he was First Lord. Yes. And resigned at the time of Munich. And resigned at the time of Munich, to his everlasting honour. What happened when the Second War broke out? Well, when the Second War broke out, uh, he had, anyway, having resigned, he had an a assignment to go to America and lecture. And uh, just about the time of the war. And then he didn't know what to do, and he went to see Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain, who never really liked him, I don't think, thought he ought to be a soldier, but poor Duff had still got putties and uh, Sam Brown belt and all, it didn't work. And so he thought, but I'll go and I'll talk to America about the war. And Mr. Chamberlain said, no, don't talk about the war. Don't, no, no, that would never, never do. 
And then Duff thought, well, he can't go on talking about English literature or something, so he did talk about the ball. It and we had a very successful about. and a magnificent tour right across America with very successful lectures on the ball, mm-hmm. saying people who want to stay out always are drawn in. And you went to the Far East shortly after that? Um, uh, yes. So, uh, yes, we went on to make a report on the Far East, which took us to live in Singapore and then to go long outings to India and Burma and to Australia and New Zealand. And that I enjoyed very, very much. It was enormously interesting. And then we left ten days before Singapore fell. You went right around the world on that occasion? Yeah. And when you returned to England? Uh, when I returned to England, well, then there was a small holding life, with uh, which I enjoyed enormously too, which was um, three acres and a cow, and uh, many more animals than one was allowed. Yes, you did all the work yourself. Yes, couldn't ever leave because of the cow. <laughs> Can't ever leave a cow. <laughs> of course. Uh, your husband was Minister of Information, mm-hmm. and then after the war. Uh, forgotten. Oh, well, then after the war, of course, was Algiers. We went to Algiers mm-hmm. in '44, and there we stayed about eight or nine months till the war was over. And the idea was that he should be ambassador in Paris after the war, because by that time, doom was over, and uh, we knew the war must end. Yes. And I loved Algiers. Wonderful time. And then you, he became first post-war ambassador to France. Yes. What had happened to the embassy during the occupation? The embassy had been entirely chock-a-block full of every conceivable thing. I mean, not only the British Empire furniture, but the British Empire sports and hockey sticks and sponges. I, I, you can't <laughs> imagine the stuff that there wasn't in that embassy. And it took three, two months to get it out. And then at last we got in, and then I liked it very much. I hadn't been very happy before, because I hated leaving Algiers, funnily enough, although the war was over. But um, then we got into the embassy, and we were enormously helped by a wonderful little haute bohème crowd of people like Louise de Villemorin and Jean Cocteau and all that little world yes. of uh, art and music who made it very successful. After your husband's time as ambassador in Paris, you stayed on to live in France? Yes, we had. We took a lovely house in the park of Chantilly with cascades and fountains which appeared to belong to the house. They didn't really, they belonged to the great chateau. But we, we lived like... Uh, Oh, old kings of France in this park. Yeah. And that was a very happy time. Very, and, very happy time. And then you wrote three memorable volumes of reminiscences. <laughs> well, that was after my husband died, I wrote the memoirs. And uh, they turned out... I didn't know... I didn't have the slightest idea how to write. I'd never written. And just by the grace of God, I, they came off. And I was heartily ashamed of them at the time, and now I've got very fond of them. You live in London now? Now I live in London, in a place called Little Venice. Yes. Where I'm um, always pleased that I live there, because I have wonderful neighbours. And my son lives there, and my niece lives there, and uh, I've got... uh, The neighbours are perfect, and it's very pretty. Do you think London has changed very much for the worst? Yes. Enormously, don't you? Yes. Enormously. I think it's terrible that they didn't put all those huge buildings on the other side of the river and make made a new New York, which would have been very fine, instead of making all our pretty houses into those pathetic pygmies. And, uh, oh, yes, I think it's changed cruelly to look at. Having been a swinging teenager yourself, do you think they're overdoing it today? It's too difficult a question. 
I don't think I know, because as you tell me, I was swinging then and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose they know it either. <laughs> no, I don't think they are. I think they're all right. You've been listening to a podcast from the Desert Island Discs archive. For more podcasts, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. This is the BBC.